Writing CSS is getting both easier and more powerful with cross-browser support for container queries and has and nesting and so much other very exciting stuff. So I wanna talk a little bit about the state of CSS, the ecosystem, and what some of my recommendations are today. By the way, everything here will be in a blog post down below too if you prefer to read through this or reference it later. So let me walk through both on the user experience as well as the developer experience, how we can make a site that loads really fast and loads styles efficiently. So for UX, styles should load as fast as possible and have small file sizes. Style sheets should not re-download unless they change. So we apply the proper caching headers so they can be cached in browsers. Three, the page content should have minimal or no layout shift. Nobody likes that experience, right? And four, fonts should load as fast as possible and minimize the layout shift. This is like somewhat related, but I think still important to include. Now, the UX is definitely more important and our tools should give us a developer experience that helps us achieve that UX. So what do some of those points look like? Well, first, we want to prune unused styles, minify down the CSS and compress it to be as small as possible, helping us get those small file sizes. Two, we want to generate hashed file names so that we can enable that safe caching. You don't want to try to cache a file that doesn't have a unique identifier in the name. And three, we want to bundle CSS files together so we can make fewer network requests. Finally, we want to prevent naming collisions to avoid visual regressions. Now, these are just the things that we can do in our styling solutions that help enable that better user experience. But of course, we're developers. We like good tools. We like things that help us write more maintainable styles. So what are the things that can help us just enjoy using our styling solutions, but maybe don't affect the UX as much. Well, you wanna make it easy to delete styles so you can co-locate your UI code, whether whatever framework you're using, but making it easy to also delete the corresponding styling code for that as well too. You wanna to adhere to a design system or, or a set of themes. You wanna have editor feedback with good TypeScript support, auto completion and linting, and you wanna receive that feedback in your editor so that you can have this good DX as you're iterating on your application locally. It's really never been easier to write great styles without having any additional tooling and have it work cross browser. So I've built a small example here showing some of the latest CSS features. I just wanna walk through them in this code sandbox and you can check it out later. So pretty simple example, but it shows some cool things. I think the biggest thing for me personally is nesting. So in the past, this is what I would pull a SAS for or a CSS modules for, or even going back further, something like less too, which a lot of people still use. So the fact that this is now built in to the browsers, it's supported cross browser. I think that's huge. I also don't think that a lot of people are using variables or custom properties, even though they've been around for a while, I think there's still a lot more adoption for them to be had. So that's a cool one if you haven't seen that before as well too. Um, container queries are super, super cool. So. When the max inline size here is 500 pixels, we're saying we wanna have different sizes on this blog post element. We wanna change the padding. Oh, and we can have nesting in here as well too, which I think is pretty cool. So let me just drag this over and we can see the font size and the padding changes a little bit. So pretty nice actually. And there's a bunch more stuff that we could do in here, but I just think this is a nice small example of some of these features that don't require any additional tooling or pre-processing or build step. Now, because CSS has progressed, does that mean that we do not need a build step anymore? Well, maybe, it kind of depends. I think for a lot of people, you probably still want a build step. First off, it's unlikely that all of your users are on the latest browser versions. And secondarily, you're probably always going to want to use some features that haven't yet landed cross-browser, especially if you're on the bleeding edge. Now you can use the supports CSS rule and have some progressive enhancement. So when a feature is supported by a browser, you can offer it. Otherwise you can have some other styles. I think that's great. I think more commonly people will have something in their tool chain like a lightning CSS that has transpilation and it will have syntax lowering. So let's say you wanna use CSS nesting, but the browsers that you're targeting for the visitors and the users of your products don't yet have support for this, they're not in the latest versions, you can still write code and prepare for that future. So I think this is pretty common. If you wanna learn a lot more about this, I highly recommend this post from Harry Roberts. He's extremely, extremely smart. 
and an expert in this area. This post, the three C's, concatenate, compress, and cache. Great overview, definitely check it out. Now there's one last bit I wanna talk about that influences some of the recommendations I'm gonna make for what styling solutions I think are great in 2024, and that's streaming. And I think the best way to demonstrate this is to show an example here with Google. So if I go to Google and I type in uh, flight New York to San Francisco, well, first off, Google has no idea what I was going to do when I landed on this page. So I'm served this initial loading shell. There was no way it could have pre-computed ahead of time that I was gonna search for flights. So there was no way it could have known to render this widget and include this style. And this isn't the only widget. Of course, there's uh, timers you can do. There are um, scores, football near me or something. I think there's probably, okay, well, there's probably a way to get scores to come up. Let's try ESPN. Okay, I don't know. But if there's a game going on right now, you could get scores to show up in line here, which I think is really interesting. But my point by and large, is that there's no way that Google knows ahead of time that you want to have this timer. I'm going to erase the timer now to try to explain this. So how does it know how to include the styles on demand? Well, it needs to be able to stream in the styles. And recently, the latest features in React and Next.js support streaming server rendering and streaming CSS. So I'm considering those as well too when I'm including some of these recommendations. Okay, let's talk about my first recommendation, which is CSS modules. You can consider them like a very light layer on top of native vanilla CSS. And CSS is making some improvements here to support features kind of like modules with layers. But I think it's really interesting that CSS modules are supported in basically every single bundler and framework. So for example, in Next.js, you can already support this today by writing .module.css. And under the hood, the compilation chain is going to make the CSS module files get bundled together and also run through minification and compression as well too. So definitely check out CSS modules if you want just the most basic solution for styling CSS. And again, in the context of the app router, this also supports streaming as well too. On the CSS modules docs, it has links to pretty much every single tool and framework that's supported. And there's probably even more than this. So very widely supported, pretty good option. The second option I want to talk about is Tailwind CSS. It's what I write my website with and most of the things that I create. I really like it. I know that it has both people who love it as well as people who don't really like it. But the great thing about Tailwind CSS, in my opinion, you can, of course, co-locate your styles with your code. But from a user experience perspective, the great part is that it generates the classes used on demand when you're doing the compilation process. So. There's many, many, many different utility classes. For example, this example here, I'm not using all of them. I'm only using a subset. So I don't want to include all of that CSS. So what Tailwind can do, granted in this extremely simple example, I'm just using the CDN. This is not what you would do for production code. But what you can do in your build process is say, okay, here's the examples or here's the class names that I'm using. Generate my CS file just based on those class names. So the maximum file size, if you stick to the Tailwind design system, to the Tailwind framework, would be every single Tailwind utility class. And even that, it's you know it's a non-trivial size, but it is definitely smaller than the ever-growing append-only style sheets that you see in the wild. So Tailwind can be a pretty good choice. Um, just to show an example of what this looks like on my blog, I'm only using Tailwind. And I see in the head of my document that there's a style sheet that links out to this compiled CSS code. So I've got this hashed file name, which means that I can cache it indefinitely with the immutable cache control header. And if I open that up, I see this, you know, jumble of code. But basically, Tailwind has included only the style sheets that I'm using. It's got compressed. There's no white spaces here, for example, trying to get the, fault, the smallest possible file size uh, when this is downloaded and then cached in the browser. Again, not everyone loves Tailwind. I think it makes some pretty good trade-offs and one of the really nice benefits that I found is revisiting projects like a year, two years, three years later after I've been using Tailwind, it's pretty much the same API. So, you know, you got a text Excel, you're going to know what you're looking at many years later. So there hasn't really been a lot of tool churn there, which I do actually appreciate quite a bit. Okay, the last solution I want to talk about is StyleX. And you could also bucket this under the category of 
zero runtime CSS and JS solutions. There's a couple others that are similar to StyleX. I think StyleX has some different trade-offs that we can get into, but that's the general category here. So really there's two main issues that a lot of CSS and JS libraries have right now. The first is that they have a runtime, so they're including extra runtime JS. I think we've seen in the past two to three years, pretty much all the libraries that made this choice are kind of going back on it, or they're deciding to rewrite or move away to have zero runtime JS. So they still like the benefits of the CSS and JS, but they don't want the runtime JS. So that's one. And then the second is compatibility with streaming and compatibility with some of the latest, um, the latest React and ecosystem features as well too, like server components. So StyleX, since it's used by Meta, it's created by Meta, used for WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, a bunch of things. It of course, obviously supports the latest React features and that architecture. So that's really great. Um, I think this option or vanilla extract or some of these other solutions that have zero runtime, they're all pretty great. And I don't personally write a lot of CSS and JS code. This is actually the first time I've ever used Silex. So I have this example here that honestly is, it's not terrible. Like it's kind of funny to me that a lot of the critique around Tailwind is the readability of the JSX and how it's like hard to read that. I think what StyleX is going for here is in the JSX, you're kind of, this is your your structure of your DOM. So you've separated this part of the file for that. And then this part of the file or you know, put somewhere else, I guess, but I think they prefer to have it co-located. This part of the file or these lines are specifically for your styling code versus in the Tailwind example, they're kind of both here. And I can see pros and cons to both of that. I think that's kind of a, personal preference basically, but you know, it's worth trying out to see if you like it. I think a cool thing here too, is I also have these um, tokens with this style X file here. So I have some design tokens, background color, title color, text color. This is what I was using CSS variables for in the other example. And in the Tailwind example, I was basically just using the built-in design system that Tailwind gives you, which I would highly recommend sticking to if you can. So it's interesting. I think it's worth checking out. Um, and I had fun building with it. So Stylex, CSS and JS, definitely changing and different in 2024, but worth looking into. Okay. So that's how I'm writing CSS in 2024. It's never been easier to write great styles without having a bunch of extra tooling, but also the tooling is pretty helpful and it's supported cross framework, cross bundler more than ever as well too. So very excited about the state of CSS. Hopefully these thoughts were interesting and I'll link the blog post below too if you want to read the long form version of this or look at any of the examples that I mentioned. Peace.